Hello everyone and welcome on board the Sunrise Safari here. I don't think we're going to be seeing the sunrise because it's completely overcast and a little bit chilly this morning about 17 degrees Celsius or 63 degrees Fahrenheit. But what a great start we've got off to with a large breeding herd of elephants. My name is Scott if you haven't met me before and I'm teamed up with Andrew on camera today. James is headed out with Brian on the other vehicle and Nikki is directing the show with a little bit of help from Kirsty and Tara. So we came into this area this morning hoping to find the Inkahuma Pride. They were last seen hunting buffalo in this area late last night at the end of the Sunrise Safari and I've come back here hoping to find some tracks of them or who knows, maybe even them on a buffalo kill. But before we could find any tracks, we bumped across, bumped into this large herd of elephants. So let me just reposition quickly and get back in front of some of them. They're quite spread out at the moment. And there's some more about a quarter of a mile off to the left, but they're all slowly feeding in this general direction. And it's quite handy because it's actually taking us in the general direction that the Inkuhuma Pride was last seen chasing the buffalo last night. It was too hard for anyone to follow them because the bush was very thick. Everybody just moved out the area and now the search begins again. Now, if you may be joining for your first time, a very warm welcome. And it's important that you realize two things about this safari. Firstly, it's live. It's happening this very second. Hard to believe, but true. And it's also interactive. So if you don't believe me that it's live, send through a question on either email, at questions at wildearth.tv, or you could hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Send us your name and where you're from, and that way we can chat to you and understand exactly how you guys are feeling. A big up, a big thanks for the updates from Joel and Arcadia who were obviously monitoring the Juma waterhole camera last night and there was a lot of lion vocalizations heard and who knows who it could have been, either the Inkawuma Pride or possibly even the Birmingham Coalition. I know Arcadia mentioned she doesn't want it to be the Birmingham Coalition because she doesn't want to see any more bloodshed and I certainly hear you Arcadia but it is a reality over the coming months. There is going to be some carnage amongst the lions as the Birmingham Coalition come in and stamp their authority on this area. It's a little bit tricky because even though there's lots of elephants, see too many at the moment because the bush is so thick that they're all moving. But hopefully in a minute or two if we just take a bit of patience we should get some good views of them as they continue to work their way through this thick vegetation towards us. to have to do for now, Andrew is not going to be very happy with me <laughs> because 
this is not a cameraman's ideal scenario to be in. You can see a large grey blob or two in the thick bush, but like I said, they are slowly moving towards us, and if we allow them the opportunity to, to decide how close they would like to come to us, we could get lucky. Also, it's quite nice for you to see different angles like this because you get an idea of how well even such a large animal can blend into these surroundings. And I've often been greatly surprised whilst on walking safaris and even from the vehicle at how close you can get to these giant beasts before actually seeing them. That looks like a young bull, and you saw him kind of charge towards the other one playfully there. It would be bullying, because the one on the left is certainly bigger than the one on the right. But maybe he will switch his attention to us and give us a little bit of his adolescent attitude. James has decided to head out to the east of Juma just to let you know his plans. He said he has come across some tracks of buffalo which appear to be running, but hasn't found any lion tracks behind them. But he's moving into a different area to try and cover as much ground as possible. us to see where the rest of the herd is and they're also slowly making their way towards us but again there's this belt of very thick vegetation that's making it tricky for us happy to hear that a lot of you are already enjoying this elephant sighting and aren't we fortunate to get off to such a great start and we've got a question all the way from Oregon good morning Jennifer good to have you with us Jennifer's interested to know how do we or how have the current guides or presenters here for Wild Earth been lucky enough to get these jobs and I guess it's slightly varying for the four of us, or five of us now, including Steph. But interestingly enough, Steph actually heard that I was back from East Africa this time last year when Wild Earth were looking for another presenter. And Steph and I knew one another as we worked for the same lodge here in South Africa. It's got two camps, one in the Sabi Sands and one in the Greater Kruger National Park. And Steph was, and still does, run a recruitment company finding guides and trackers for lodges throughout the country. So it was Steph who thankfully pointed me in the right direction. And I think Steph also got a hold of Brent, and Brent suggested James. Jamie, I'm not sure how she found out about it or how we found out about her. Good question though, Jennifer, and hopefully we'll be seeing lots more different guides and presenters coming through the Wild Earth crew, as it certainly will give you guys, the viewers, a more diverse safari experience. Thankfully, 
the youngest little bull has now popped out into a clearing, but it may be short-lived. Let's see what its next move is. multitude of different birds calling this morning which is making for a beautiful chorus and it really has been interesting to note how the birds have become so much more vocal in the two weeks that I was on leave the mornings and the evenings really do provide us with some wonderful bird song and it will continue to get even more intense into the summer months. One call that we're all looking forward to hearing is that of the Woodlands Kingfisher. Which we will hear all day and sometimes all night during the summer. And not only is it a wonderful call of the summer, but it's also one of the very pretty birds that migrate back from Central and North Africa back to this area for the summer months. Well, Andrew is doing a great job considering how thick it is in there. And it is quite nice to have these obscure angles from time to time because it does give you an idea of how thick the vegetation is that these animals can move through and need to move through at this time of the year. There's not much food left now, so they're having to become quite resourceful in where they're finding it. And interestingly enough, I think two days ago on drive, we were watching elephants feeding on very dry branches and they were surrounded by the bright green bushes of guari trees. And guari bushes have got very, very high tannin content. They are bitter and distasteful. And I mentioned that I'd never seen an elephant actually feeding on a guari bush. But yesterday afternoon on tracking team, we saw an elephant doing exactly that. So another good example of our textbooks and our even past experience cannot always be perfectly re reliable. That's a small jackalberry tree that it's now stripping the leaves off. Again, not hugely typical. And look at how wonderful his eye is. He's very close to us. And he just scratched his ear there. Anyway, it was the first time for both myself and Steph out on tracking team yesterday seeing an elephant eat on the highly bitter leaves of the guari bush. And it looks like this youngster may give us a little bit of a show here. There's quite a few other elephants moving around our this area. They're slowly approaching us. So our patience has eventually paid off. We've been 
talking about change of seasons and how the summer is rapidly approaching us. And Kay has asked us, will we be changing the safari times? Because currently on the east coast of America, the broadcast starts at 12.30 and finishes at 3.30 in the morning. And yes, Kay, we certainly will be changing the game drive times. The mornings we will probably be going out half an hour earlier and possibly the afternoons half an hour later. We're just trying to decide on the best time and possibly we will change sometime next week. So that may suit some of you and it may not suit others, but apologies, we do need to just come out at the best possible times to try and show you the best possible action out here. Look at that rough and textured skin. Full of crinkles and creases. Nice and close to us now. Elephants typically tend to feed quite slowly in the winter months because I guess for two reasons they need to search more closely for tasty morsels as well as the fact that they're probably just a little bit tired and ever so slightly undernourished so they're on the go slow oh wow look at that shot keep watching closely look you can see right into its mouth you'll also notice that there's hooked thorns on that little branch that it was chewing on oh hello there's a mother coming up to us I think she's more interested in the plants that we have parked next to. They're not necessarily us, so I don't think we have anything to worry about, even though she is very close. She's battling to get this thorny branch that she's just broken off into her mouth without it getting snagged on her lips but it seems like she's worked it out now. Listen to her chewing. work from Andrew on camera there. It's always a bit difficult for the cameraman when they zoom in because they run the risk of the animal moving its head ever so slightly and then disappearing out of frame. But Andrew did wonderfully that. I'm sure you all enjoyed that close up. do love the safari live experience because there are so many of you on board with us we get a multitude of fascinating questions and one of which has just come through from Patsy and sorry Patty and Patty's in Seattle and she's asked a question that I don't think I've ever heard before and that is whether the African elephants will be able to communicate with Indian elephants. And I actually don't have a clue, Patty. Half of me is telling me that yes, they possibly could, but then the other half is, is, is saying no. So I don't have a clue, but if any of you do know the answer to that, please feel free to share it with us. And that way we can all learn and share interesting knowledge and I think that really is an interesting question, Patty. So thanks for sending it through. And if nobody manages to find out the answer during this show, I will be sure to do some research on it afterwards. Isn't 
present the trunk the most incredible adaptation. You mustn't forget that it's a nose. It's easy to forget that. So not only does it aid the elephants in smelling, but also hugely in feeding. If it wasn't for that incredibly flexible and maneuverable trunk, they wouldn't be able to acquire the large amounts of food they need to feed on every day with nearly as much ease as they currently do. And quite nice just to stop and listen for a while every few seconds because you can hear almost every move these elephants are making and I know Anna Marie and Nikki in the final control are both loving listening to these elephants and hearing them chew on the branches. It also gives you a great idea of just how dry it is at this time of the year. Every step they take and every branch they chew on cracks and snaps. Which is very easy to hear. And I guess as the vegetation gets drier it becomes harder for the herbivores because they've got less food. But it's also important to remember that it also makes life a little bit harder for the carnivores. They've got less cover to hide behind when stalking their prey. And they also have this very noisy, dry leaf litter and grass that makes stalking silently up to their prey a little bit difficult. So I guess both predator and prey do find hardships in the drier months. I haven't heard anything on the radio about lion tracks, so I'm quite fascinated that nobody has found any tracks, but what that could mean is that they may have been successful in their buffalo hunts, and they could be not very far away from where we are here, snacking on a buffalo. Failing that, it's important to remember that it is a large area that these animals get to roam, and so do we. And maybe somebody just hasn't traveled down the right road yet to find their tracks. And one thing that none of us know regarding the Inkahuma Pride is whether the two members, Junior and one Lioness, did actually successfully manage to relocate the other five members of the Pride. So that is something that we would love to find out. And I know Lily B was asking after that specific point. But Lily, we're going to have to go and search for these lions to determine that nobody actually saw the Lions reunites and shortly after the end of the evening broadcast when you were with Brent and the Lions everybody moved out of the area because they moved into such a thick area that you could not follow them so nobody knows just yet but hopefully it won't take long for us to work out where they've gone anyway I'm sure a lot of you would like to jump onto James's vehicle to get an update on how his morning is going and I'm sure have one or two laughs in between. He's a very funny character if you haven't met him before. So enjoy, and we'll see you all a little bit later. Good morning, good morning everybody, and welcome to Wendy. Wendy being the um, slightly irascible Land Rover 90 that I am currently sitting upon. Uh, we're sitting here beneath a Balanites tree uh, with some nyala, 
Now, before I tell you about them, I shall tell you a little bit about what you're doing. Well, I suppose you've been with Scott for a while, so you know you're on a live morning safari and that we want to hear from you as much as possible. Hashtag Safari Live if you're tweeting away in the modern fashion or questions at wildearth.tv if you're on the email. Like I say, the SA Post Postal Service has been on strike for roughly nine months and so sending us a postcard is a bit of activity. On camera this morning we have Brian who is dressed in a variety of uh, different um, ruffs and buffs and uh, warm things and some rather fetching slip-slops. It's quite impressive, really. Um, anyway, we're sitting under this tree watching some Nyala eating the last seeds, excuse me one second, of some of a torchwood tree. Sorry, the radio started to explode in my ear there. And what they're eating is are the seeds of this torchwood tree and the seeds are filled with a very nutritious oil that is flammable and that's not why they're eating it but it's also very good for them at this time of the year because there's not much else to eat now I've, all the way around here and I'm sure you were looking with Scott at how those elephants were blending so beautifully into the gray background that background is gray because there are no leaves on it now these nyala are almost exclusively browsers which means they don't eat grass and so they eat seeds and leaves and pods if they can find them and at this time of the year things are pretty lean and so they are now eating the seeds of this torchwood tree and I suspect that they can't eat that many of them you know torchwood tree oil is also used to sort of kill fish so it's not I suspect this there are elements of it that are a bit toxic and so they're probably only eating it now because they're slightly desperate for food. Anyway, it's a very beautiful and peaceful little scene out here. So I'll just give you an idea of what we're listening to and what we can hear and smell. Very quiet this, this morning. Just the wind basically rustling through the dry twigs and just shifting the grass a bit and every so often I can hear a white browed scrub robin calling way in the distance I believe there were some birds around the elephants but on a cloudy morning like this which has a slightly eerie feel to it there's definitely less bird song than there would be otherwise tremendous peace as I drove out this morning. Sometimes you feel an air of expectation and excitement and today I just felt a sort of contented peace. Hey Brian? Mm, very much so. Yeah. That's exactly what these sort of these nyala are reaffirming as they graze peacefully beneath this tree. Just in the distance I can hear a southern boo-boo. And they call in duet, lovely duet. <laughs> right, so I think we'll probably drive on from here. We came into the eastern side of the reserve today in order to see if we could find some tracks of some, perhaps the Birmingham boys coming across onto uh, Juma and there are no tracks coming across here and f interestingly the Matimba males who I'm sure you're all wondering about now perhaps you're a new viewer and if you are you're most welcome and we love to have you along the Matimbas were until very recently the dominant coalition of lions in this area two magnificent males and they were found today 
just to the south of us on Cheetah Plains. And that's quite interesting because they, their territory has basically been usurped by five young bucks known as the Birmingham Boys. And they, I don't know where they are at the moment, but the Matimbas seem to be coming back for a little incursion. Whether that will result in their being able to stay around for a while, I, d I don't know. I don't think so. I think that they've pretty much lost their territory. But that's basically what's happening over the lions. So we came into this area to see if we could find some tracks. We haven't managed to find any yet, uh, but we'll see. And we're also hoping to find some, uh, perhaps some tracks of Karula, a queen of Juma, a young, uh, old female leopard, or middle-aged female leopard. She was around here yesterday. And just while we're doing that, this, the, the lions are obviously in a great state of flux. And so it's, it's not, and it's difficult to understand sometimes what's, what's going on. And the textbooks don't always cover uh, the sort of strange behaviors that regular observers of lion behavior get. And Leslie in California, very nice question about why the Matimbas, at least why the Birmingham boys, would have killed a lioness. Now, in case you haven't been watching, a little while back, the new coalition of Birmingham males killed a lioness from the Unkahuma Pride at a kill site. Now, there are various reasons for this. Some male lions that come into an area to take it over do sometimes kill lionesses. We don't really know why. Uh, we think at this, what this was was a comp uh, sort of fight over food. The Unkahuma Pride was on a buffalo kill, and the five male lions came in, tried to take the food away, and sometimes the lionesses will have a bit of a fight at some young males and sometimes they'll just back off and obviously one of them decided to have a go at one of these guys and she came off unfortunately the very second best. And while a female lion is a very large creature compared with most creatures that you know of, roughly 150 to 180 kilograms, a big male is well over 200 sometimes and so it really isn't a competition at all in terms of a fight so I think that's why um, it's fairly abhorrent behavior it's not unusual though when a, a coalition takes over and remember when these coalition take over an area they're full of testosterone and testosterone does make males of all species slightly more aggressive than they would be otherwise and so they're full of testosterone they've been looking for the males of the area to try and take over so they're the, the best way to describe it is a lovely way is to say that their blood is up and if a hum, as a human being you want to know what that means if you've ever been in a physical fight of any kind or you've perhaps played a sports game a very competitive sports game and it takes you a while after that game to sort of come down to calm down and that your blood is up at the end of it and that's exactly I think what happens with these male lions they rush around here trying to take over territory and they're testosterone's coursing and their blood is, is up and they're, they're looking and they're aggressive and looking to try and take over territory and then if they come across something that challenges them they're going to come off second best so I think basically that's what happened Leslie right on that um, slightly aggressive note on this peaceful morning we are going to reverse out of here it's probably going to make a horrible noise because we're parked on a couple of strychnos trees and, in fact, before we do that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the strychnos tree. The, um, this strychnos tree here, let me try and break off a piece. This is called strychnos madagascarensis, or the black monkey orange. Now, strychnos madagascarensis is called strychnos because of the presence of strychnine. I thought only in the seeds, until... Recently, Eugenius, who is our technical genius, who basically makes sure that you can receive a high-definition signal all the way from the middle of the African wild here, he was uh, busy helping Jamie get out of a hole, and he cut himself on one of these branches. And the next day, his arm was basically rotting off the front of his body, uh, which was very unpleasant for him. And he went off to the doctor, and that's what... The, it, some, I think it was probably an allergic reaction as well, but he got some strychnine of some kind into his arm and it created a rather nasty wound. Anyway, we sewed his arm back on and he's okay for now. We didn't really sew his arm back on, he's just got a little bandage on now, but he's fine. So, very toxic this tree can be. 
uh, but especially the seeds. You don't want to eat the seeds of the tree. Okay, on that note, we're going to press on, see if we can find Karula's tracks, perhaps some lion tracks, perhaps something else. Who knows? Right. In fact, I'm just going to go and get a little piece of... I'll try and find you one of these seeds that the torchwood or that the Nyala have been eating. Jennifer, while we drive, I said I was going to tell you what I what I was smelling, and I, um, I'm sorry I, I did not do that. I it was most remiss of me. Um, uh, Brian, there's not a huge amount of smell with the wind blowing, and so it's it's sort of a fresh, it's fresh dry grass with a hint of moisture in the air from the front. Yes, hint of dew. But it's always lovely out here. Thank you, Jennifer, for reminding me that. I'm just going to jump out the car and see if I can find your torchwood scene. Hope that you can also see all the elephant dung around here, of course, and that's because the elephants love the torchwood seeds. Here we go. That is a torchwood seed. That's what the, the animals are eating. I don't think I'm going to have a taste of it myself. Um, they're supposed to be flammable, but every time I've tried to burn them, I've made a total fool of myself by just burning my fingers. So I think we're just going to let that one be. It's called a torchwood because the oil inside, if you gather enough of it, is, is supposed to be flammable. So that is the torchwood Balanites Mogami. Apparently the favourite of a uh, Nicky Austin in the final control. Right. drive out of here, I gave you a little bit of a description of Brian's wardrobe, um, and I described his shoes as flip-flops, and MJ wants to know if that's the same as slip-slops. Um, yes, yes indeed it is, sorry about that Brian. I think I've chosen a rather poor route out of here. trying to extricate us from here without too much noise, but I'm not sure that that's going to happen. Watch your heads, everybody. Brian, sorry about this. No thorns. Brian is. I wish you could see him. He's just performed a remarkable, a remarkable um, act of strength and acrobatics. You know, Brian actually was part of a circus at one stage. On the trapeze, you were, Brian. On the high trapeze. Brian's about six foot four. So it must have been an extremely high trapeze. <laughs> the things we do for money. back out onto Mumba Road, where I have mercifully not seen the Mumba yet. And this was the site of my first Karula meeting about, I don't know, eight weeks ago, I guess. And I haven't seen her since. And Twin Dams is just down there. It's now a Twin Dust Bowl. And that's where Brent had Karula yesterday before she, in typical Karula fashion, spirited away and didn't leave a track. By the afternoon she was gone.
signal's not good, sorry about that. And I'll see you just now. He's tracking the lines. Welcome back everyone. And James was just going through a little bit of a tricky signal area there. So apologies if the picture was a bit shaky, but welcome back on board with Andrew and myself. We did find some tracks of at least a few members of the Inkuma Pride. I'm not entirely sure whether it was of all of them, five of them, or just two of them. They were split up into two different groups yesterday, for those of you who don't know. And they were heading west towards our boundary with Arethusa. So on our left is Juma, on our right is Arethusa. And I'm just going to check carefully down this boundary road. If we don't have any tracks coming out, well then we'll reassess and make another plan. I know Steph is also out on foot doing some tests with the, with the backpack for the walking safaris. And he has found tracks of the two individuals that were alone yesterday. But there's nothing to say that they have not yet rejoined with the pride. Have some evidence and I can see where the lion was actually lying down here on our right it's not easy to see but those marks are probably from where her tail was sweeping the road when she was lying down and then up ahead you can see some tracks not easily from this angle that is a lion track heading straight into Arethusa. So good prospects. Now as we continue driving along, I just want to see how many tracks I can find. And that way we'll be able to establish whether they have possibly relocated or how many members of the pride we are actually following. So that was one there. I think I saw another one further up. I don't think this is the whole pride. I think possibly this is the two individuals that could not meet up but didn't manage to successfully reunite with the rest of the pride last night. So, what I can also tell you is it looks like there were some human footprints around those tracks analyzing how fresh they might be. So I think some of the other guys are already on the trail. is that there is a road very close by that will loop us around in the right direction to continue following up on these tracks. It appears that two of the Inkumas crossed back west into Arethusa. Just south of Dalinati's junction on Triple M. It's really important for us to keep everyone updated on the radio networks as to what's going on. And that way, by sharing information, we can all collectively work together in trying to track down these animals. I've just switched over to another radio station that's used whilst on Arethusa and a different one's used while we're on Juma. And the reason why there are different radio channels is to simply create less congestion and radio chatter. It can be quite off-putting having a lot of radio chatter when you're trying to guide your guests. And that's why there are different channels for different areas of operation. Good morning guys, Scotch here. Anybody managed to locate on uh, Ingala back across west over Triple M by Dalinati uh, Road?
Okay, well now we are on Arethusa. <coughs> and hopefully we will be able to get some updates from the guys. When I got onto the radio now, I didn't hear any responses. So, I'm not sure what the problem could be there, but no need to panic. I'm sure if there's anything interesting going on here, we will find out sooner enough. And when following tracks of animals, it's important to not worry about necessarily seeing each individual footprint, but it's a bit of a trial and error game, a lot of leapfrogging and looping ahead. Because if you were to stay looking for each individual footprint as the animal moved, you'd probably never catch up to them. Please could you change base stations because I cannot share anything you are saying. And as we move deep into Arethusa, sometimes the radio that I communicate the final control with doesn't work too well. So just ask Nikki to try and change onto a different radio channel as I cannot share anything she's saying to me. interesting sights. I haven't been here since I went on leave and this is Red Dam but currently as you can see there's no water and it's just a dried out mud wallow and it is harsh times now for the animals when I left three weeks ago this was a little puddle where animals could drink and because there are less places for them to drink now, it kind of helps us in a way because it concentrates animals in the areas where there is remaining water. So that's kind of helping us, not really great for the animals, but there's a lot of water around you so they don't have to travel too far. And we've just got a question through from Daniel. Morning, Daniel. And Daniel's all the way in California. He's asking, why don't we see lions on every drive? Uh, it's a good question. Um, there's a few different answers for it. Basically, the area that we are allowed to traverse is not very big, and therefore there are simply not always lions on our property where we are allowed to go. So that's the main contributing factor. Another very important factor is that even when they are on our prop property, Daniel, they can be difficult to find. Just like this morning, there's been no sign of any lion yet, even though they are in the area. So we fairly convinced some of them could still be on Juma. I'm convinced at least two of them have possibly come across here onto Arethusa. And it's just difficult to search all the areas, Daniel. The, the, the blocks uh, which are encompassed by roads are sometimes very big, and therefore it makes finding the animals when they are in the middle of these blocks, especially if they're thick blocks, difficult to find. But we do do very well here compared to a lot of other wilderness viewing areas and we typically are spoiled with great game viewing and another thing i guess that's important to mention that it's not only about the lions daniel as great as it is watching them most of the time they fast asleep so i would personally prefer to watch a weaver bird build its nest than watch a lion sleeping or watch just about anything on the move than watch lions sleeping but on the flip side, you do need to invest time with the predators when they are sleeping because we never know when they're going to get up. And it's when they get up and active or potentially some prey stumbles upon the lion when they're sleeping that action can unfold. On top of that, Daniel, there's been a lot of shifts and dynamics between the lines in this area. There's currently a 
huge dispute going on between two males, the Matimba males, who are old members of an e even larger coalition that splits up, but they've become very dominant in this area and are now in the process of being overthrown by five young males. And this shift in, in dominance and power has already caused quite dramatic changes in the Inkohuma pride's behavior. And they've even lost one of the lioness from their pride to one of these five new males that are coming through. I know James touched on that a little bit earlier. And it doesn't make sense that a male lion would kill a lioness that you could in the future mate with. But I think James's summary of that is that you, they're in such a heightened rage and in such a hype as they're coming through with all their testosterone and adrenaline as they're trying to qu acquire this new territory that sometimes lioness will get caught in the crossfire. Also on top of that, a lioness or many lioness within the pride of the Inkohumas or any pride will naturally want to defend and protect members of their pride, in this case junior, a young male. So the Birmingham Coalition would have maybe had their sights set on Junior, the young male, and the other lioness within the pride may have tried to stand up for him and then got caught in the crossfire. still no further sign of any more tracks but we've done a very big loop ahead of their general movements of direction which is another reason that makes it difficult to find lines in this specific area that we're working now the blocks are very big if there were a lot more roads through this area it would be easy to crisscross and find their tracks and then eventually find them but there simply aren't many roads in this area So I still haven't heard anything from the Arethusa guys, although now it sounds like somebody might be trying to. Morning, go ahead. but we'll keep prospering forth and maybe we'll get close enough to one of the vehicles to be able to actually hear them but I can't hear a word anyone's saying at the moment. searching for these lion or anything in that fact along the way we can update Mars and Arizona on another animal that we have been looking for several of them actually and Mars is interested to know do we know where the new hyena den site is and sadly Mars we don't we've got a few speculations as to the area that they could be in but we have spent time on foot there. I spent an hour walking around an area where I thought we could get lucky and didn't come up with anything. I just saw some tracks in the road, but the hyena tracks it looks like. So sadly, Mars, no, we're still in the process of working out where they've moved to. And we are also missing them. they great quality that hyena den and it'll be interesting to see how much bigger that tiny little black cub has got but for now we don't have any good news about that 
It is important to say that Mars also did mention how much they loved yesterday's drive. I guess both morning and afternoon were both action-packed and full of big cats. And naturally on safari it will ebb and flow some drives and sometimes you'll have lots of big cats and others they'll be gone or at least not gone but evading our presence in these big thick blocks that surround the roads. topic of discussion for the coming weeks and months and that is of the Birmingham coalition trying to take over the territory of the Matimba males and Suzanne is interested to know how far will lions travel in order to acquire a new territory and I guess then how big will that territory actually be um, in terms of how far a coalition may need to travel from when they are kicked out of their pride until when they actually become big enough and bold enough to try and dominate an area, it will vary entirely on the individual scenario of that specific coalition, how big they are, how many dominant coalitions are around them, but they could move large distances. 50 to 100 kilometers away from their natal area but in other cases they may not move too far in the case of the Birmingham coalition they come from probably about 10 or 15 kilometers away but have stretched up to 30 or 40 kilometers away whilst waiting to become big enough and bold enough to come back into this area and acquire dominance they moved much further north into the Manuleti reserve which is to the north of us and they moved there kind of in February or March after we saw them a lot during November, December, January they moved considerably further north, further away from their natal range where they spent about four or five months and it's only been in the last month or so that they've been coming back into this area and that could be because there's a very big dominant coalition further north that they would that they've sized up and they rather would not try and overthrow and that's why they've come back south to where they know there's two males that are beginning to get a little bit old so there'll, there'll be huge variances in each pride takeover and within each coalition's life and the areas that they move in will always be greatly different They have to be somewhere, but at the moment we're just getting no clues, I'm not seeing too much else along the way to stop for. Trust me, we're not avoiding anything frantically searching for this line. But there just doesn't seem to be too much else going on for now, but that could change in an instant. We could come around the corner and have the whole Inkawuma pride chasing down a buffalo for all we know. Wouldn't that be a great change of scenery? All we know is maybe a leopard, wild dog. We did get an interesting report mentioning that the wild dog pack that has been denning to the north of us in the Manuleti have actually started running with their pups so from about two to three months of age wild dog pups will be moved will no longer rely on a den site and will start running free with the pack so the pack do not always go back to a den every night it's only when they have cubs uh, sorry pups 
and once they start running with the pups at around two to three months of age, they will then move huge distances and sleep wherever they re require to. They don't have to go back to a den. And the last message we got from somebody in the Manuleti is that they were seen heading south. So hopefully they keep coming south through the Buffelswick property and then we will get to see the new additions to one of the wild dog packs. We were unfortunately kind of right in the middle of no man's land and therefore didn't get many opportunities to view the wild dogs while they were denning, but now that they've stopped denning, we can expect to see an increase in sightings of them. One more try on the Arethusa radio. Can anybody copy me? The antennas were all upright and secure, which they are. Sometimes they get bent backwards, which will, you know, frequency isn't as good. But not sure what could be the problem today. to what to do now because I can't communicate with any of the Arethusa guides and that coupled with the fact that I'm convinced it's only two of the Nkuhumas that crossed here it might be worth heading back to Juma where we could try and find the entire pride or the remainder of the pride the other five members of the pride but driving down this road and see if we don't get any more <clears throat> we might get a few more clues along this road who knows possibly some tracks of another animal that might be worth tracking down It's still completely overclassed and quite a moody and dramatic morning here in the Sabi Sands. These clouds will in all likelihood not provide us with any moisture and it would be a very pleasant surprise if they did. It's still a few months until the rainy season kicks in. What this overcast weather does make though for us is tricky tracking conditions. Very difficult to see tracks in flat light. Ideally you have morning sunlight beaming in from the east or afternoon sunlight from the west at a low angle. Which casts shadows on the tracks and makes them easier to see. that James has also not had much luck this morning but we're going to send you across to him anyway for a change of scenery and that way maybe I'll be able to focus on trying to get a hold of these Arethusa guys and find out what's going on over here. We will see you all a little bit later. Hello everybody, welcome back to Wendy. Um, we have found tracks of Karula that is the good news. The bad news, of course, is that she can fly, and so the tracks have been lost. They did come into this block to the left of me, and she was heading towards where I am now, but I haven't found any further tracks. Although there are two honey badgers. Look at that. Look, Brian, can you see them? Oh, man, 
I don't know if we're going to be able to get in there. Oh, should we try it? There's two honey bitches there. There they are, on the termite mound. They're still running around there. Please don't go away, little honey badgers. really get close to them. We're on this termite mound. I'm just going to stop here for one minute. And we're running around this termite mound here. Two of them. seem to have disappeared. Oh, what a sadness. Anyway, you've got a brief glimpse of them. Um, we'll just, we'll do a little loop around there and see if we can't get a better look. So Karula was heading towards this area, but, you know, it's, we could probably spend two or three hours just on foot in the drainage line trying to find her tracks, and so we probably won't do that. She hasn't seemed to have come out onto this road. Um, and I think the tracks are probably from early last night, so she could really be anywhere. So we're going to drive out to the east, back onto the sort of eastern cut line, and then back down along the southern uh, boundary and see what we can find there. I know that Steph, who is on foot testing the walking kit, um, has managed to find a couple of lion tracks, so that's good. While honey badgers are largely nocturnal animals, it's not entirely unheard of for them to be active around this time of the day, especially when it's a cool day like this. I wonder if they don't have a little home in this termite mound right here. I saw was a flash of white from that white mantle that they have on their backs. And unusual to see two of them together unless it's a mother and a youngster or perhaps a courting couple. Watch out there Brian. Nearly took off Brian's left hip have made him very unpleasant. And, uh, wow, that was amazing. So, just for those of you who perhaps don't know, a honey badger is um, a mammal known as a mustelid. It comes from a family called the mustelidae. And that's their name, I think, for the smelly anal gland that they have they will use liberally, a bit like a skunk, I suppose, if threatened. And they are known as one of the most voracious or sort of toughest predators out here. And they eat, they'll eat any kind of meat that they can find. And they are, I mean, they've been seen warding off lions. They're known to be particularly vicious, a bit like a, I suppose, a wolverine from the Northern Hemisphere. That's a similar kind of character that they have. They're very tough. Um, and not to be trifled with lightly. If I stand about that high off the ground, quite long, very shaggy skin, and they're known as a honey badger because what they do do is they will follow a bird called a honey guide. They have a sort of symbiotic relationship where they'll follow the honey guide to a, um, a hive and break open the hive. And while they're eating the honey and the wax, the honey guide will eat the bee larvae, and because the honey guide is obviously not strong enough to open up a hive on its own, it leaves the, the badger there, and the badger will use its huge long claws to rip open the hive, and so they share a meal together. The only 
other time I've seen them here was with Andrew. We saw he spotted um, a mother and a, a little pup. And they were much more confiding than those two, which seemed to just disappear. I suspect they were courting. They looked like two adults to me. Here's Karula's tracks right here. Karula's come out onto this road, right onto the eastern boundary, and I suspect she's disappeared into Torchwood. I'm afraid the tracks in this light are going to be very difficult to see, hey Brian? Yeah. Yeah. She's there. She's just going across the road in front of us. And then... There she is. And off into Torchwood. I'm afraid. Oh, well, at least we know where she's gone. Not that that helps us a great deal. Yeah. Right, we'll just do, I'm just going to turn around quickly and we're going to head down and do the southern boundary. She could, of course, be sitting in a tree here some kind of hapless breakfast. So, the reason is a very good question that um, I know this is, well, I'm, I'm guessing it's Karula. It's most likely to be Karula. Mainly, well, we know it's a female leopard from the tracks. They're, they're small and obviously female. And then... How do I know that it's not shadow, for example? Well, it's well out of shadow's territory, well within the area that Karula's been spending time. And look, it's not impossible that shadow would come out here while she was mating with Tingana. But again, Tingana would be way out of his territory and his tracks would also be around here. So I think it's most likely that this is Karula's tracks. And I mean, she has been around here, a little bit south of here and up to sort of Twin Dam's area. That's been her, her sort of territory for the last little while. Interesting question from Zumi Jody. You would like to know what noises a honey badger makes. Um, I don't know, you know. Brian, have you ever heard them making a noise? I, don't th I think they're pretty silent, you know. I don't think they make a huge, a huge racket by default. Um, they will growl. I've heard them growl um, like a sort of angry dog. But I don't think they make too much other noise, actually. That's quite an interesting question. I'm pretty sure it's just a growl. They probably make a throaty growl. baboon tracks on the road and I don't know why but we don't get a lot of baboons around here every other reserve I've ever worked we've seen lots and lots of baboons <coughs> Badgers, while we're on the subject of honey badgers and what they eat, they will eat honey, of course, and they'll eat bee larvae, and they'll eat any kind, they'll even scavenge. <coughs> and in some areas, they eat snakes. And Tina, you ask, have I ever seen them eat a cobra? No, I haven't. But there is that wonderful footage of a honey badger, I think it's in the Kalahari, fighting with a snouted cobra. I think it's a snouted cobra. And the cobra actually bites the badger. The, and the badger kind of um, collapses and you think it's going to die and then about three hours later it stands up and wanders off. It's absolutely fine. They process the venom very quickly. So I haven't seen them eat a cobra, but absolutely they will eat snakes very readily if they can get hold of them. Baboons go all dead. A cycle tour through some 
reserves up in the very northern reaches of South Africa and in southern Botswana and southern Zimbabwe. And at one spot, there's a, an interesting relationship that's developed between the farmers and the elephants of the area. So elephants will eat, especially at this time of the year, will raid crops, uh, especially if it's a citrus farm or something like that. They'll go in there and they'll raid crops and there's nothing you can do to keep them out. Even an electric fence and an elephant will very quickly learn to break by um, they won't run through it, they'll take sticks and break it down. They're incredibly intelligent. And they've, what the farmers have done is basically made a pact with the elephants that they will get a certain supply of oranges per week or month or whatever it is. And it, what it does is it keeps the elephants away from the farms and apparently this has been going on for decades. Anyway, the one place we were, the, I was sitting on a rock, a magnificent area where these huge kind of granite boulders rise out of the plains. And I was climbed up onto one to film across towards the camp where the cyclists were. And in between me and the, and the camp, there was a, was a sort of feeding area. And two trucks, not trucks, tractors, low bed tractor with the low bed tipper trailers came on full of oranges. And there, was, there were one or two elephants around, but as soon as they, those tractors started coming towards the area, you could hear the baboons start to shout. From miles all the way around, from about three kilometers, you could hear them yelling. They recognized the sound of the diesel tractors and started gapping it. You could see them herring across the rocks from all directions, coming towards the oranges, and then they would sit and fight with each other over over the oranges and it was a hilarious thing to see and also fascinating to see how clever they are that they've learned that the sound of that diesel engine moving means oranges and a whole lot of troops converged on each other so there was quite a lot of violence in the area but eventually it all calmed down when the elephants in, the elephants kind of instilled some discipline in the feeding procedures and then everybody ate quietly and went their separate way So we've come back, to, we've done basically a big full circle here, um, checked, checked for Karula and she's gone east, so we're now going to head back basically towards um, to where Sindile was yesterday and see if we can't find him. I know that Steph and Scott are on the lion tracks in Kahumas. And Siberia Zumi, thank you for your comment. You say that there baboons around in the summer months. Well, oh, that's great. I really enjoy watching them because they, they're always doing something normally ridiculous. I don't think it's easy being a baboon, especially a male baboon in the troop where the hierarchy is so defined. And the male, the big, big males are not known to be particularly sympathetic. tracks on the road of course because this is where Shadow and Tingana went. This is exactly where they crossed over here. wondering what that um, sort of cricket-like sound is. It isn't in fact a swarm of crickets or um, a small herd of squirrels living in the engine. It is Wendy's alternator and I am set definitely not mechanically equipped enough to fix it but there is a mechanic coming through tomorrow hopefully and he will sort it out. Quite temperamental our old Land Rovers. So as I was saying, Tingan and Shadow, and if you don't know who they are, they're a territorial male leopard and male and female leopard from the area. 
and they have headed, they were mating yesterday, and they headed off in here to um, consummate their love, shall we say. And they'll probably be mating for another two days, day or two. Scott and Steph are following up on two tracks of two lions. Here we go. You see that? This is one male lion. On the road, he's coming down the road and turning up here. You see exactly where he goes. I see that there have been some people looking around here. But I suspect that they're probably from the south of us. There he goes, he goes straight through there. See that, right? Let's see if we can get you a picture of it. There we go. That's the male lion track there. Not a very good example of one. That's quite interesting. Maybe we'll just go up here and then take Chalapan Road. So, I am sort of heading towards where we saw Sindile yesterday, but we did spend about three hours with him, so it would be quite nice to see some lions. Possibly doing something. So he's headed in there. I'm just going to drive around here, on the other side of the block. And while we're just trying to figure out what's going on with these lions, uh, Scott has got a very large avian predator with him, and we'll go across to him and see what they're doing there. Welcome back, everyone. And we didn't find the predator we were looking for, but we have found a very, very special bird of prey. It's called a martial eagle. It's by far the biggest bird of prey that we get in this area, and it's got a two and a half meter wingspan. Hard to believe, but they are massive. Not the best view. It's all I huddled up. It's quite cold still, and like most birds of prey, they wait until things heat up before they start flying. That way, they can conserve energy. They don't need to flap their wings. Look him focusing his head in all different directions, possibly looking for some prey. Even though it is cold, he could bomb down onto them. There's a tree squirrel that you may be able to hear alarm calling. I'll just keep quiet for a few seconds. And because I'm guessing this martial eagle may have been here for a while, the squirrel's alarm calls are not as intense as they would be when this eagle first arrived. And you could say the squirrel's almost getting tired of continually chattering out that alarm. But it'll be interesting to see if any other animals come along to try and mob this bird of prey. Forktailed drongos are often the boldest of the smaller birds that can fly in and try and peck these birds on the head and get them out of the area. Look at that bright yellow eye. They've also got those beautiful little brown spots on their white undercarriage. And they are capable of catching huge prey up to the size of baby impala. Dikers, steenbuck, monkeys, will all fall prey to these birds, as well as Franklins and guinea fowl. But for now, I think most of the prey animals are safe, and it looks really too comfortable and cold to be doing any hunting just yet. 
Sadly, you can't see the squirrel otherwise. I'll try and point it out to you. Some of you may remember a wonderful sighting of a martial eagle. Who knows? Possibly the same one. Feeding on the remains of a kill, and that was with Jamie a couple of weeks ago. Oh, David and Goliath. <laughs> the Cape turtle dove on the left. Who's obviously maybe trying to impress some ladies. But that Cape turtle dove will probably know that this bird of prey usually attacks larger prey species. And it's obviously, oh, well maybe it's just realized now where it's sitting and it ducked off hurriedly. You can also hear the call of the go away bird, quay, in the distance. And the squirrel is still going at it. Interestingly enough, yesterday when we were looking for the two members of the Inkahuma Pride, we heard a squirrel alarm calling, and much like this, you could hear the squirrel was kind of tired and therefore had been alarming for quite some time. And Steph and Andrew went off on foot and found a martial eagle that they were shouting at. It's difficult to distinguish between what a squirrel is alarming at, but generally they can lead you to interesting sightings. I remember it wasn't too long ago driving through the Mawati River where a squirrel led us to a genet in a tree and Jandre was on camera. He managed to get a glimpse of it darting off through the bushes. This is a big marula tree that the eagle is perched in. It's going to be fascinating to watch the change as the leaves start to bloom and after the leaves will come the marula fruits which are really tasty, high in vitamin C, the elephants love them but this tree is certainly going to transform into a very very different scene in the coming months Sadly, no further luck with the Inkahuma Pride, either of the two portions thereof. But we still do have time on our side. We're only halfway through the show. So, maybe something will change a little bit later. be on lion tracks here. I'm told James has found some male lion tracks that are heading towards Twin Dam. So, oh wow, look at his head. I really love the way they bobble their head from side to side in order to focus. I wonder what it had seen off in the distance there. Because it all is all huddled up and not sitting as it normally would, it's not the most pretty display that you would usually see a martial eagle in. Usually they will be standing more upright they're a very bold bird of prey. Here it is here. Depending on which way the wind's blowing, the little crest you can see here can be ruffled upwards. But it's not always going to be clearly visible. But what you can see is a lot of those brown specks that you would have been able to see earlier. And those massive talons that are capable of latching onto, like I said, baby impala. They also feed on monitor lizards quite often large monitor lizards which is quite tough prey they are hardy animals and very very strong and I've actually seen footage of a martial eagle riding 
a very large monitor lizard. It had latched onto its back and the monitor lizard was continuing to try and walk off. Eventually, the martial eagle won, but it literally got carried by this monitor lizard. So they can be quite interesting in terms of the larger prey that they hunt. Sadly, I've never actually seen one catch anything. It's one thing that I really wish we could somehow manage to do is see the birds of prey hunting more often, but understandably, because they fly so quickly and move so far, it's very difficult to be at the right time to see them actually strike. So, something to look forward to in the future, but it is a very, very difficult thing to capture on film or even see. I wonder if we should maybe go and look at the squirrel. It could be quite amusing. Let's go and see what the squirrel has to say. sitting. Oh. There's another bird we can show you that. That's going to be alarm calling. It's not the squirrel. But it's a go away bird that's just flown and landed in this tree. And I'm not sure if I've stopped in the right spot for Andrew. Oh, no. There he goes. And let's see how much attention this go away bird will draw to the martial eagle and who knows maybe they will come and mob it the squirrel is sitting in this tree somewhere oh here they come here come a lot more go away birds there comes the action we were hoping for thoughts and backups you may have seen another one flying off there and let's watch closely what happens here sound like the squirrel is sitting in the same marula tree as the martial eagle but I can't seem to spot it it may be hiding in a small cavity and alarm calling from there where it knows it's entirely safe let's just drive around a little bit and try and get a different angle <coughs> flick up when they alarm and that's why I think this one may be in the cavity of a tree because we can't see that characteristic tail flip. Stop here and see what Andrew can manage to do. There are lots of branches in the way of the martial eagle but the, there's a go there bird right in front of it. There it goes. Quite funny if we can only see its little head poking out of a hole. <laughs> well, we've just got a great comment through from Rume, and they suggested that the Squirrel is alarm calling at something, but we need to rush everyone. We've just got a report that there's some leopards at the Juma water hole. So sorry, Marshall Eagle, and sorry that we didn't get to show you the squirrel. But we are very close by, so let's hurry on along there because they could disappear quite quickly. And I'll be so lucky to have that Juma water hole cam, and thanks to whoever did send through the reports of the leopard. We'll be there in about a minute. And I think it was Curious One who let us know about that report, so thank you so much. Let's hope we get there in time. Hold tight, everyone.
left as it could be. Maybe I'm full up. Who knows? Maybe it's Shadow and Tingana who have come back and we'll get to see them mating again. Either way, we are very close by, so don't go anywhere. We're actually racing right past the final control room, which is just over to our right, where you can see that big mast. And that's where Nikki and Tara, Tara and Kirsty are sitting. I wonder where the part on the dam the leopard was or is. I'm told the camera is pointing up to the left, so maybe that is the direction the leopard headed in. There's a, a lot of go away birds alarm calling to the right though so I'm inclined to think that that is the way we need to go it could just be that the go away birds are having a feeding frenzy around in a jackalberry tree which are providing a lot of fruits at the moment so it could be misleading well at least we are close I'm hoping. Just want to get on. Heading towards the lodge, apparently. So it appeared, I've just got to report that it was apparently heading on the other side of the dam up towards the lodge. Uh, now I know what the go away birds are. I'm pulling up. We'll show you quickly. You got it there, Andrew? Yeah. It's a Varose eagle owl. So another massive bird of prey. So that solves that problem. That's why we got bought here. And sorry about that, Mr. Owl or Mrs. Owl. We are continuing in search of the leopard. Isn't it wonderful to hear all those go away birds calling out? Okay, and we're getting some great information through from you guys, so thank you so much. I think Kathy said that the leopard headed towards the same tree where Kunyuma had a baboon kill, and I know exactly where that tree is. So let's just hurry on quickly here. So we get into the right area, and then I might slow down a bit and start looking for tracks. So the kill where the baboon kill that Kunyuma had was off to our left. And it is a tricky area to search this because there's a lot of thick vegetation where the leopard could be hiding. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stay on this road and then take a little sneaky track back down towards the riverbed that flows into the dam. Okay, well, no evidence of any tracks coming out here. So we can hopefully assume that it's still down to our left between the lodge and where we are. drop down into this little riverbed just towards the dam. 
apparently the leopard was scent marking. And that update came through from the Siberia Zumi. So thank you very much for that update. Thanks, Andrew. Again for tracks here. Didn't seem to see any there. What would be interesting to know is if the leopard came and left in the same direction. So if any of you could provide us with that information, it would be great. Or did it come from one side and then continue in the same general direction? The reason why I ask that is that if it did in fact go in on the same direction that it left on, just listening now, I thought I heard dwarf mongoose alarm call. I can still hear the go away birds going absolutely ballistic. So the Verose Eagle Owl is still probably sitting there. And the alarm calls that I thought I heard here subsided, so... That was a bit of a false alarm. And I'm told that where we are now, the leopard headed up to our left. It's very thick bushing and I can't get the vehicle in there. So the only option we have is to drive around the block one more time back onto the road that we initially went down. Maybe I did miss its tracks crossing that road, which is in Vubu Road. Sounds like we could actually be on the exact pathway that it was walking on as it left the waterhole. Can't see any tracks, but that's not to say they're not sure. There's a host of different tracks here making it quite tricky to see what's what. Uh, okay, what I'm gonna suggest is hopefully we can send you across to James and that way I can just stop and concentrate, spend some time on foot and walk around and try and work out what's going on. But in the meantime, before you go, I'm just going to check here. Okay, well the good news is he's just got back on the vehicle. He's also been off tracking that line, I think. So he's ready to receive you. Wish us luck and hopefully we'll have some good news for you shortly. Hello, hello everybody. Um, you greet us here at Wendy. We've been following the tracks of a male lion heading off into this block here. Um, Ephraim from Cheetah Plains remains on foot um, somewhere in here. And we've done a loop around and he doesn't seem to have come out yet. So we don't know who he is. It's quite a sort of lone male lion chasing buffalo. Don't know who he is, what he's doing, or what he's about. So it's very interesting. I'm really hoping we'll be able to find him. Last tracks were coming through this block here to the right of us. And this is where I left Ephraim just to go and retrieve the car. And obviously.
thank you very much to all of you who were keeping an eye on the Juma Dam cam. Uh, keeping an eye out and spotting a leopard was rather brilliant of you. And thank you for your updates. Please keep watching it. We do get a huge number of sightings from the Juma Dam cam and that's because people like you are watching them all the time. Now, I'm just going to check carefully on the road to see if tracks of the male lion don't come out. I'm just wondering where old Ephraim is. I wonder if he hasn't gone down into the drainage line here. tracks are pretty fresh. I'm just going to whistle for Ephraim. There's an alarm calling squirrel there. But it's in mm. theory going the wrong direction. I can see any lion tracks crossing the road. The squirrel may be alarm calling Ephraim, of course. So we're just going to reverse a little bit to check to see if tracks don't come out onto the road. I'm going to just stop and have a listen. Um, Steph is calling me on the radio, so excuse me one second and let us see what updates he has. Go ahead, Steph. Copy, I'm close by there. Um, where would you like me to check? Steph's got... Okay, copy that, so confirm around quarantine. Okay, copy, thanks. Steph has got some kudu alarm calling around where he is, and that's quite near quarantine clearings. Lots of squirrel alarm calling, it's very difficult to know what on earth is going on here. I will do. Nikki and um, Steph's trying to get hold of you. So I'm just going to quickly check around here for the, where the squirrel were alarm calling. Steph is basically in that direction there, on some lion tracks. But I don't see any lion tracks on this road here. The schools are shouting up ahead. Have a quick look here. Now, the squirrels, of course, could be shouting at a lion, a leopard, a snake, a bird, any number of things that might threaten their well being. There's ones on the ground there running next to us. Right, I'm going to turn around. I don't think if he's running about on the ground, I doubt it's anything particularly um, voracious in the way of ground predator. Probably a snake in the tree. Right, we're going to head up towards where Steph is. Go ahead, 
देखो Copy that, and from also there are long calling Kudu and line trucks around Philemon's dip and Philemon's cut line junction, Gary Main. Uh, Steph is on foot there. So basically, Ephraim's trucks are going off to there towards Twin Dams area where we've just come from. And I'm in two minds as to which way to go. I think we're going to quickly, we're closer to there than we are to Steph. So we're going to quickly try around Twin Dams where Ephraim is. And then we're going to head towards Steph. It would be very nice to find this male lion and find out who he is and what he's doing. So we're only sort of a block away. Come past Twin Dams, of course, but these tracks are so fresh that maybe they've, the lion is there after we were. Just as we drive, have a look at this tree in front of us here. You can see the greeny, greeny tree. And it's just starting to lose its leaves now. It's a jackalberry. And the jackalberries are semi-deciduous. And what that means is that they, they lose their leaves very quickly, sort of at different times of the year. It helps them to avoid competition. And it'll, that, that tree will lose its leaves probably within a few weeks and then they'll, almost, they'll come back almost immediately. difficulty with following the lion tracks here is that he was, did look like he was chasing buffalo. And so, when they are running through a bush area like this, their tracks become much less obvious to follow. looking in parlor over there, which is sad. Keep looking, Brian, keep looking. More buffalo tracks all over the road. reckon they were heading straight towards this area here. But he's just done a loop around the other way and I can see him coming up there. <coughs> and there are very a number of relaxed nyala around here, so I don't know where this line's gone. Must have taken off a bit like Karula. stop here and just quickly talk to Ephraim. I'm coming on home. Yeah. Okay. Tafa manjan. Okay. All right, man. Dinta, dinta mfuna Steph. Ileka Gauri main pipeline. Yeah. Okay. Right, beautiful Nyala. We're going to go towards where Steph is.
couple of baboon questions and comments as we drive around trying to figure out the mystery of the lions. Um, I feel a bit bad just leaving this tracks here, but I think we must go and help Steph. Um, Elizabeth and Edward. Elizabeth, you say they used to be from Minneapolis. Uh, you used to the troop around here called the Gauri Gang. You don't know where they went. Welcome back everyone, sorry I haven't had time to plug in my earpiece, I just jumped off the vehicle there so I didn't know we were live until Andrew started clicking his fingers at me. Well, things aren't looking good at this stage. Um, I haven't managed to find one track of this leopard. And Andrew was just saying, often when we do get these waterhole reports, when the leopards head north away from the dam, most times we don't actually relocate them. It's a massive block north of the dam. So apologies, but thank you very much for the updates. Let me plug my earpiece in now quickly. Tracks here. But there's also tracks of a female leopard heading up the road away from us. So what I'm going to suggest doing is going onto Mvubu Road and seeing if we don't have any luck there. It could very well be the same leopard that was seen from the dam that walked along the riverbed upstream and then has now veered away from the dam. This is the general area where we also think the hyenas could be denning and I can see a lot of hyena tracks of all different shapes and sizes here. But in and amongst them, one set of female leopard tracks going up here. So let's continue, turn around quickly and see if we don't have any further luck. told that it's hard to tell but the pictures that have been sent through do in fact look like a female leopard. I did check this road junction carefully just before you came across to us. And I didn't see any leopard tracks, but maybe she cut through onto this road, which would have make kind of sense because it is a general movement of direction north and west. In this flat overcast lines, I'm battling to see any tracks though as I'm driving. I know Georgian said we the leopard headed northwest, so you're spot on there with your directions, Georgian. Try 
try and solve the mystery of where this leopard's gone, I can't help but keep thinking of where are the Inkahuma pride? tricky business finding these animals even when we've got a report knowing that the leopard was there just minutes before us oh. so in times like this it's often best to stop the vehicle, not stop searching, but search in an alternative manner, and that is with our ears. To drive around this area permanently looking for the animal on the very few roads that we have, we can't cover enough ground effectively in the exact area where we would like to be searching. So rather than continuing driving down this road feeling like just because we're covering ground we may find the animal, it's better to stop and listen and hopefully we'll get some clues from animals just like the go-away birds were alarm calling at that Burroughs eagle owl earlier and just like they were also alarming at the Marshall eagle they will make the same noise for a leopard and so will the squirrels and other animals like the bushbuck and nyala and parla a lot of the antelope will alarm call and we can hear further than we can see so we'll just sit tight for a while and see what happens and listen we can answer a question that's been sent through from Holland morning Tony and good to have you with us Tony's interested to know I chatted briefly a little bit about the hyenas moving den sites earlier and he's interested to know would they have moved den site because of the Birmingham coalition's presence in this area and I feel very strongly no there'll be different guides that tell you different things about how predators interact with one another but I believe strongly that the impact of the Birmingham coalition coming into this area will only impact the lion. The leopard aren't going to flee. The hyena aren't going to flee. They're going to carry on business as normal. Just like we've seen not long ago, young Sindile, a young male leopard lying only a few hundred meters away from a timber male mating with one of the Styx females. And he was very comfortable, even though he was in eyesight of them. It's not like he saw them and ran for his life. They are capable of escaping these predators when they need to, the other predators like lion. And I think it's simply that the hyena wanted some new real estates and they usually moved in sites simply to find an area where there are less parasites. So that's something that contributes strongly towards hyenas moving den. You can understand once they've been in any given den for a long period of time, the excrement and parasite load gets very high. And when they move out to a new den, they'll find it squeaky clean and ready for their arrival. So that's my theory. And I don't think the Birmingham Coalition have had any impact on why they've moved dens. Maybe they wanted to get closer to a good source of water. And they are close to now the Juma waterhole, as well as a little waterhole in front of the Gallego camp where water is pumped to. So maybe it was water that caused them to move their den. And that for me would be a more realistic scenario. Sadly, no noises yet. No alarm calls. And wouldn't it be interesting to know how far away this leopard is now? It can be so frustrating knowing that it was right there and a minute too late we have come up with nothing. Obviously it doesn't make myself or Andrew look very good at what we do. Even with such good clues and such good intelligence, we still can't find you a leopard. 
yet. <laughs> uh, okay, I think I'm going to drive back down the same road and then stop again. good opportunity to actually send you across to James and that way Andrew and myself can really focus I can unplug my earpiece cut my hands behind my ears and increase the volume of the surrounds around us it's a really good trick that works incredibly well and hopefully with a little bit of time spent here we will get some more clues failing that we'll hopefully find something else for you anyway without further ado over to James, and I hope he's having more luck than we are. Hello everybody, welcome back to Wendy. Um, there's so much going on here. Um, I think the lions have been found to the north of us in Buffel's Hook, so that's not a great, not a great indication of, um, or not, not great news for us. I'm pretty sure. Brian thinks he spotted us in Dile. We've come into this area, we found his tracks, and oh, Brian thinks he spotted yes. him. Where is he? Straight ahead of us. Oh, you're a genius. Well done, Brian. <laughs> so we just, Brian just spotted a little male leopard. Oh, there he is. That's brilliant. He, what a good spot. Just see if you can show everybody what you saw. Can you see the leopard, everyone? You can just see, if you look in the fork of that tree, in the fork of that tree, there's just, you'll see one or two little spots. There, you can see them moving now. That's a little male leopard. <laughs> what a brilliant spot. Well done, Brian. Good job. <laughs> so we saw, <laughs> that's great. Um, we saw his tracks coming along the road and they were on top of some human tracks that were that was Steph who was on, on a walk and so we knew they were very fresh and here he is he's not far from where we left him yesterday oh that's great that's so nice about this tree that I'm pushing over. It is an encroacher species. The more of them we push over, the better. Likewise, these strychnoses, or Eugene attackers. He's just next to his favorite termite mound, just over there. What are you eating, fella? and have a look at him. This is very close to where he was yesterday. Now just a quick update for those of you who don't know, this is a year old leopard and he's been in around this area for the last three days now and that's because his mother has absconded with his father in order to try and make him a sibling or two and thank you for all of your kind comments about Brian's brilliant spotting skills I think it's remarkable that he managed to see this leopard at that distance through the strychnos thicket and we've had lots and lots of questions about whether he'll survive when will she come back and feed him Will he be okay? And I think he's finding little bits and pieces to eat on his own right here. His belly is always full. Yeah, that's a nice surprise for the morning. 
he's such a special little chap this so he's been now in this area we found him yesterday afternoon afternoon before that so he's been around here for just over 48 hours in a radius of this is about as far east as he comes and he goes sort of to the road behind us so he's in an area of about say a hundred square meters about a hectare not a hundred square meters a hundred by a hundred so about a hectare he's wandering about in about a hectare waiting for his mother to come back How are you feeling about your spot? I'm oh, very chuffed. Very, very chuffed. <laughs> so, continued kudos on Twitter for, for Brian's spotting skills. And as you can hear, he's very pleased with himself. He's a very humble, humble fellow, Brian, so he must be really, really pleased with himself to have said so. pleased it wasn't Andrew who spotted him because Andrew would have made an enormous noise. He becomes so excited he's able to contain himself. So just while we look at that leopard, those lion tracks went a huge distance. They covered, they went from the very south of Juma and crossed well over the north of Juma. So probably as the crow flies a distance of about seven kilometers from where we first spotted them. Very studiously clean fellow is uh, Arsene Diller. making sure that all of his fur is in good salon quality. And if you can imagine the roughness on your house cat's tongue, now, you know, imagine your house cat is in dealer's size, and that ratio of your house cat's size to some dealer's size is about the same as the roughness of your house cat's tongue to this cat's tongue. And the tongue is extremely important to in helping them to tear and clean carcasses of fur, which they obviously can't digest. So they use the tongue extensively to pull hair off the kills that they make. looking at Sandile and sweet relaxation there, an interesting question from someone called Mafuta on, uh, in California. Now Mafuta, I'm not sure if you gave yourself that name, I don't think it's, you, you're flattering yourself hugely. Um, you want to know the difference between coming to the Sabi Sands and going to the Kruger National Park. Well, first thing to remember, of course, is that the Kruger Park is part of the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park which is three and a half million hectares of contiguous wildlife area. So whether you come to the Sabi Sands or the Kruger Park, you're actually part of the same system of wildlife. So that's the first thing to remember, Mafuta. Then the second thing to remember is that when you come to the Sabi Sands, you can't drive yourself around. So you don't, you go to a lodge and you get onto a Land Rover similar to the one that I'm driving and to the ones that you see every so often going past us and you go with a guide and the guy take you around and show you what the delights of the area have to offer. If you go to the Kruger, you can drive yourself in your own car, and it's a relatively safe activity. In fact, it's an almost entirely safe activity. And 
you do share the park with the rest of the public but you're able to drive around two and a half million hectares basically anywhere you like uh, with freedom the big difference of course is that we can drive off road here in the Sabi sands and the private reserves but you can't if in the Kruger you must stay on the roads so while for example there's a car that's just driven past and dealer now and um, they won't see him from the road well they will stay they've just backed up and they're going to view him from the road but they can't actually drive in here and if in the Kruger it's exactly the same if you see a leopard off the road you can't really drive in here to have a look so that's the real advantage of investing in a holiday in the Sabi Sands much cheaper option to go to the Kruger but the Sabi Sands is obviously uh, much more expensive but you do get an incredible game experience so my foot I hope that answers your question question why are we looking at young Sindile there and his colors in and, in around, and around the gray and the golden brown of the grass and you can see that the white is the most obvious thing and without that white uh, he'd be pretty much invisible and that's why I'm so impressed with Brian's spot now Bugsy M now Bugsy I don't know where you are in the world but it'll be very good the next time you talk to us please tell us where you are um, it's always nice to know you want to know about colors and what colors are wearable in the bush and whether it affects us um, it affects animals or if it affects um, safaris and that sort of thing Bugsy, it does to a certain extent if you wear a very bright white top and you're walking in the bush um, animals will definitely pick it up because it reflects more light likewise if you wear a bright yellow top that reflects more light yes it will make a difference to animals animals are effectively colorblind they probably don't see in black and white but they do see different kind, different hues and variations uh, but they're effectively colorblind except for the birds and so it doesn't make a huge difference if you wear a dull blue or a dull green uh, I don't think the animals uh, notice a huge difference I think the best color to wear out here is a gray it's a dull matte gray or dull matte blue or dull matte green the car key that people wear especially after it's been washed a few times tends to be a very bad color to wear because it shines it starts to reflect and it's actually quite light so I think if you want to really hide yourself out here and you don't want to wear camouflage fatigues which is just ridiculous um, then yeah you want a sort of dull khaki or dull green dull blue or dull grey I'd say as I say that I'm just trying to disrobe Sandila in this area we've had lots of questions about if or when Shadow will come back and will she ever feed him again or will he be left here to starve quietly on his own and Doug in Phoenix a nice one how long would he sit here bef b waiting for her before he decided to sort of mosey off I think that he's his movements will be dictated almost entirely by hunger so once he's denuded this area of little Franklins and dwarf mongoose and things like that I think you'd find that he'd move on and become a nomadic male. It'll take him a while to do that. Um, he is a little bit young to be doing that sort of thing at this stage. Um, but I think his mum is going to come back once she's finished mating. Well, I hope she does. Look at that. Look how beautifully camouflaged he is, except for the white colour underneath his chin and on his belly. Such a lovely color. 
colour a leopard. So there's been a huge amount of concern shown for him over the last little while, while he's been alone, and it's 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 well founded because his mum is very it's very early for her to be mating again. Zurich, just before we go back to Scott, who's got some wonderful elephants, um, Heidi in Zurich, you would like to know what the chances are of Shadow being falling pregnant to Dingana over the last over the next three or four days. Heidi, I'm not sure exactly what the chances are, but I think pretty good. If she's in proper estrus, then chances are that if they remain together for the next two or three days, she will ovulate and possibly conceive. So I think the chances are pretty high. Let's put them at about 70 to 75 percent. Right, let's head across to Scott and the elephants and I'll see you in just a little while. Welcome back everyone and very well done to James and Brian. Thankfully they rescued my lack of leopard finding ability, so at least you got to see some dealer and we managed to find this beautiful herd of elephants. There are some very big cows with beautiful ivory and also lots of youngsters. So with a bit of luck I can also see more elephants approaching from the thick bush. I think it could be the same large herd that we actually spent time with this morning at the start of the show. One elephant you would have hear, heard water hitting the ground, that's all the water there that it's been tossing up. Let's watch and see if it doesn't do it again. Yeah. Just playing with the, the water. actually a bull so let's see if he doesn't give us an attitude which it looks like he's doing. Hello boy. How are you? Quite close to us. There's nothing to worry about. But isn't this wonderful to have all these elephants completely relaxed just in front of us. We're very fortunate in some areas of Africa where they are persecuted by poachers. They certainly won't be this relaxed but they know they're safe here. And other than a little bit of attitude that they may sometimes give, it really is nothing to bother about. Wow. Not too sure what that was all about. The big bull in front of us obscured the view. Possibly some elephants jostling for a good position at the water hole. This one's missing its left tusk, maybe it broke off. You can only see a piece of the right tusk coming out. There's a lot going on here, so Andrew's got his work cut out for him. This bull's picked up a small bone, interestingly. Look closely here. Look at that. Well, elephants are known to pick up and carry bones, especially of other elephants. And now we can see the, very clearly the prehensile fingertip, which allows them, just like now, to pick up small artifacts like this bone. 
Incredible. The Indian elephants, which we spoke about earlier, because we've got a great question through asking whether or not Indian elephants can communicate with African elephants. I didn't know the answer to that, but I can tell you that the Indian elephant does differ from the African elephant in that it does not have that prehensile fingertip. haven't got to the bottom of whether or not they can communicate with one another but thanks to Marianne and Kathy for sending through your thoughts James also isn't sure oh look here this is interesting this elephant will not have the prehensile fingertip because it's lost the end portion of its trunk and I wonder if it is the usual half trunk that we see usually she travels alone with just two of her offspring, so it's three of them traveling together for the majority of the time, but we have seen them linking up with herds from time to time. And looking at the size of the individual next to her, it could well be the half trunk with the one sibling, the other one slightly smaller. It's worth taking a moment to imagine being an elephant and every time we wanted a drink we'd have to inhale it into our nostrils and then blow it back into our mouths. I think that this could very well be the same half tail individual that we've seen from time to time because now looking up to her left the smaller calf does look like her youngest one and that's all three of them there together now so that's the usual three that we see from time to time and happy to see that they have joined up with this herd for the time being. Interesting, interesting through from Marianne. Thanks very much on the differences between Indian and African elephants. And she says that there was actually one recorded birth of an elephant calf that was fathered by an African elephant and mothered by an Asian elephant, but the calf only survived for two weeks. So typically that will not be possible for them to interbreed. still doesn't answer our question as to whether they can or cannot communicate. There's a cute little calf, probably close on a year of age. We may notice a little bit of infrastructure in the background. This is Gallagher Camp and that looks out onto this waterhole. Sadly all the guests are out on game drive now but hopefully between drives they'll get some more elephants coming to drink, or who knows what else may pop in.
Well, I haven't been able to count them. Too many have moved off, but I guess there's probably around 20 of them. A lot of them have moved into very thick vegetation that runs down towards the Juma waterhole, and maybe that's where they'll pop out in about 15 or 20 minutes. actually been stopping and standing and just relaxing after having a drink. Well, I hope you managed to hear that beautiful low rumbling sound. It was this individual right here that made it. And that's the half trunk female. some great info from Gerda on Twitter saying that her right ear has a little bump on it, the half-tailed female, and sadly Andrew won't be able to pivot the camera backwards quick enough because she's about to disappear into thick bush, but I did just get a glimpse of that little bump. It's kind of on the middle of her ear, Gerda, if that's the same one you are talking about, so thank you very much for that little snippet of info because all the info we can get out here is makes for a better experience and we can better understand all these animals so thank you very much for that sadly i think this elephant sighting has drawn to a close because most of them have moved into thick bush but let's try and turn the vehicle around and see if we do get one last glimpse of them and while we try and do that we're going to send you back to james and Cindile. enjoy and hopefully we'll be able to get you a few more glimpses of these elephants Everybody, welcome back to Sundila, who is still having his morning toilet in the privacy of this little piece of bush where at least three or four cars have driven straight past him and not seen him. Thankfully, I had Brian on the back of Wendy this morning and he spotted Sundila's tail flicking through the Strychnos thicket in which we now find ourselves. Very peaceful morning, and we've just been listening to some Koki Franklin's calling. And the birds, like I said yesterday, will start to call more and more as we head in towards spring. But not much calling in this kind of eerie grey light. Nothing at all, have I? Mm -hmm. Nothing at all. <laughs> it's totally silent. Wendy's engine is making one or two strange noises. Fascinating question all the way from California. Um, 
And uh, the reason I was silent for so long is that it's quite a detailed question, and it's a good one. Um, we know that lions synchronize estrus in prides, not all the time, but sometimes. And that's probably done through, yeah, it'll be a hormonal thing. I don't think it's a, a, a choice. Well, it's definitely not a choice. And I suspect what it is, it's, it's, it's a hormonal synchronization. And the question from California says, basically, do leopards do the same thing? And that's because they've been seen mating here, four different females, in the last little while around here. We've had someone in Koro, we've had Kurula here, we've had now Shadow, and another one just to the south of us. And so four females mating within a few weeks of each other. Now, it's possible that the synchronization, but you've got to ask yourself the question, why would they synchronize? So lions synchronize their mating because they do cross-suckle if they can, and so it takes the load off some of the mothers. If one of them is, is out hunting, she knows that her cubs synchronized estrus. No, I don't believe that they would. Um, and so I, do, I think it's probably quite coincidental. And the, the only other question to ask would be, is there an advantage to them having the youngsters, say, three months after we are now? So we're sitting at the end of August now, so that would take us to the end of September, October, November. End of September, October, yeah, end of November. Now, interestingly, the end of November, what happens, Brian? Rain starts. The rain starts. And the impala lambs drop. Yes, you put in inverted commas. The rain is supposed to start. And the impala lambs are then dropped. And... So that could be an advantage. It could well be an advantage to have your cub that time of the year if you're a leopard because food is plentiful. It's easy to catch. If you're a leopard, it's easy to catch a baby impala. And so that might be one of the reasons that they're all mating together at the same time around now. I don't think it's a synchronization. They're also not seasonal breeders. So, well, you read that they're not seasonal breeders, but it is interesting that four of them in this area are now mating three months before the most prolific food time of the year. I think that there may well be something in that. So, one question from California. Thank you very much. And just while I'm rem I remember, I, I don't think I answered Edward's question. We lost some signal. We were talking about baboons a little bit earlier. And he said, have I ever seen a baboon take down an antelope? Edward, um, I haven't seen it physically happen. I have seen baboons feeding on antelope. And what reminded me, of course, was that talking about the baby impala. And baboons definitely like to take down baby impalas. They're fast enough to do that. And so that's the most sort of obvious thing that an omnivorous baboon would try and eat if it was looking for fresh meat. Very interesting question that about the synchronized estrus, and I hadn't thought of it before. I thought about syn synchronized estrus, but not necessarily about a birth peak. And you'll read that there isn't a birth peak um, normally amongst leopards, but it is fascinating to think that, that four of them have mated exactly three months before when the most prolific food time is. Then you can also see, so we know that Sindile was born just over a year ago. So he was born in August, which is not a particularly prolific food time at all. And Brian, do you remember what when the birthday of Kunuman uh, quarantine was? Okay. I don't know when they were born, but they're just about three, so probably also in the winter. Now, viewers, maybe you can tell us when exactly when Quarantine and Kunuma were born. I think it was three years ago. Um, and so probably in the winter three years ago, or just under three years ago. So also not during that sort of prolific time at the end of November, as far as I can understand it. having a little conversation about primates while we look at Sindile 
having just completed his morning toilet. And primates, of course, are fastidious cleaners of each other and themselves. And Marilyn in California, you'd like to know, is our vervet monkeys the only monkeys that we get here? And secondly, why we don't see more of them? Marilyn, they are the only monkey we get here. We only actually get one other monkey species in South Africa, and that's called a Samango monkey. And the closest Samangos are up in the forests near Hutzbreit, uh, which is in the Drakensberg to the west of us by about, say, uh, roughly 50 kilometers as the crow flies. And they're very similar looking to vervet monkeys. We do see quite a few vervets, you know, not so much on game drive. They're not particularly confiding around vehicles. They do tend to move away quite quickly. They also, as soon as you build a camp in an area, they start to concentrate around the camp because it does provide an element of safety because some predators will avoid the camp. It also provides a source of food because they're extremely adept at theft, are the monkeys. So they'll go in and steal the odd bit, bit of food. And the other thing, of course, is that the camps are normally watered. So there's normally quite a lot more to eat around the camps in terms of natural vegetation because of the extra water than there is out here. So especially at a time like this, you don't find huge troops of monkeys knocking about the bush while there's no fruit hanging in the trees. If they can, they'll be around the camps where there's likely to be more to eat. He's such a pretty little fellow, this. And you know, we've had lots of comments about him getting bigger and his size and the fact that he's bigger than his mum now. And I was sort of starting to agree until I saw him at least I saw her with Tingana. I'd say she's about half his weight. Um, she's not very big. Uh, he's, he's a pretty average sized male leopard. Uh, but, I mean, the size difference between male and female is enormous. And he's about, he's maybe a little bit taller than she is now. But he's still a lot smaller than his father. So we don't know exactly when Kunyuma and Quarantine were born. Now, if for those of you who don't know, they are his uncles. Uh, they're Sindile's uncles, born to his grandmother, Karula. And Ellen has sent through a message that we didn't do drives at the time, and we think that they were born around December 2012. So, the, yes, they're coming up on three years. That's right, yes. Estimated to have been born around December 2012. So that would have been around the sort of prolific time of impala lambs. So maybe there is something in that, especially in this area. I think you'll find that it'll vary in different areas according to prey availability, if there is some kind of synchronization. And obviously in the Sabi Sands and the Kruger, with the number of impala that there are, it wouldn't surprise me to know that they had timed their sort of breeding with the dropping of the impala lambs. There is one, at least one predator that, that does precisely the opposite of that. And that, of course, is the wild dog. And they have their babies in the middle of winter when the vegetation is becoming thin. And that's because for a big pack of wild dogs, a baby impala is not much to eat. But because they are not stalkers, and they don't need to stalk through the thick bush. They like the bush to be as clear as possible when they're hunting, and they're highly effective hunters. So the clearer the bush, the better it is. And so in winter, they tend to have a... Comparisons always between the domestic cat and the leopard and the lion, and yes, they, are, they do share so many characteristics. And Marianne, you want to know if, if one of those characteristics extends to eating catnip um, or being sort of 
I'm excited by catnip. I don't know, Marianne. I don't think so. There are, don't seem to be any plants out here that particularly excite leopards. So I might be wrong, but I don't think that there's an equivalent out here. But they, they do roll about in bits and pieces, and often in buffalo dung, for example. Um, but I, I can't think of a particular plant that they're necessarily that fond of. Zendil is quite interesting. You know, he, this is on a totally different topic. He, he has a definite distance with which he feels comfortable, um, within which he feels comfortable being with a vehicle. And when you go a little bit closer than that, he always moves away. It's, it's quite interesting, and his mother does exactly the same thing. I've never seen him walk straight past the front of the vehicle. Have you, Brian? No. He stays within that distance that he is now, and as long as we stay here, he's generally very comfortable. So we're just going to continue our discussion of a comparison with domestic animals, and the, there's a dis question about fleas. And and whether leopards get fleas or not. Kathy, in New York, I'm not really sure that the sort of domestic garden variety flea occurs out here. Absolutely, they're affected by parasites, though. Um, external and ectoparasites. So he will be very careful about um, cleaning himself fastidiously like he does there, and that will help with ticks and that sort of thing. All right, while he disappears behind that Ozeroas Panic, Ozero Paniculosa bush. Uh, we're going to head back to Scott, see what he has to show you. He thought it will be something interesting, and I'll see you in just a little while. Welcome back, everyone. And thankfully, this herd of elephants were moving quite quickly and have all appeared just on the western edge of the Juma waterhole. And I'm guessing they're going to continue feeding slowly towards us. We are very, very close to the camp here. What an awesome sight this is already, and it's going to continue to get better, I think. Because there are a lot more elephants that should slowly be streaming down through this open clearing towards us. And who knows, possibly they will indulge in a mud bath in the muddied waters of the Juma waterhole. The previous little pond where they were... Does not cater well for mud bathing. But it's not very hot, so I'm not convinced that they would necessarily take a mud bath yet. It's not only for temperature that they will do it to cool down, but also to get rid of parasites. So I guess that may prove my theory wrong. That's simply because it's not hot. They may still want to cover their bodies in a layer of mud that will dry and cake and envelope any parasites on their skin and that way when they rub off against a tree hopefully all of those parasites will be peeled off this is a young bull that we can see disappearing off there and I think we may be in luck I think I'm actually going to follow him because there might be some aggression shown between him and another bull that is down at the water hole already and that way we will also be in the right spot to see all of the rest of the herd come down let's see what happens between these two boys just up ahead of us Looks 
like I was wrong and they are at ease with one another. And I'm going to ask Andrew to do a slowly to pan across to the left. It's going to be a beautiful view. Let me turn the vehicle though quickly, Andrew. Just to give him a slightly better angle. Absolutely awesome. Look at all of them. What a wonderful sight this is. just in front of the vehicle. Incredible. Looks like they're heading straight up to the next water hole for another drink. The water is pumped into both the last water hole that they drank at and the current one they're going to calf coming trundling past and I believe the water hole camera's on us so I'm going to give him a quick wave hello everyone I'm just going to wait for this last car to pass by and then we're going to uh, hopefully we will be able to get a great low angle of them drinking at this next water hole or at least loop ahead of them one more time wonderful Okay, well, I think it's time to reposition again, but wasn't that such a beautiful sighting to see all of them coming from a distance through that big open clearing right past us. It was very special. Well, because they have just had a drink, I'm sure they probably won't spend too long here, but you never know. There's a bit of bullying going on there and one elephant chased another one off. Andrew swung the camera around just in time. How wonderful is this low angle? I do just want to keep creeping forward. Interesting. Zoom in closely there, Andrew, to where all their trunks are. Now this is a problem that elephants sometimes cause with us, and they break the water pipes leading into the water holes. And there's one individual that's come quite close to us. It's a bull. Hello, boy. And he is very close to us. A great option. An opportunity for Henry to give you a close-up of his eye there. Settle down, boy. <coughs> now, when I speak to the elephant like that, I'm not actually trying to communicate with it, but by speaking in a calm voice like this, it can be very useful just to calm the animals, whereas if you were to shriek and panic, it would possibly have a negative effect on them. It's also very useful to be able to increase your volume as you go. And if something does get more hectic, then you can increase the tone of your voice, increase the volume, and that often does deter them. Let's take a closer look at the elephants here, because 
They're literally plugging their trunk over the pipe that feeds water in to this water hole and they've plucked it out of the ground. And the reason why they do that is they are fussy. Oh, some blacksmith lapwings making a racket behind us. Some birds. But because elephants are fussy, they would prefer to tap into the freshest possible water and that's why they do often pull out the piping rather than drinking the slightly muddied water within the pond. Looks like this young calf's waiting for its turn. Okay, folks, well, sadly, it is the end of the show, or approaching the end of the show, so we need to say goodbye to you now. As wonderful as the sighting is, we'd like to get you across to James so you could have one last look at Sindile. What a morning it's been. Thanks very much for following. And hopefully we'll find out where the Inkuhuma Prada are. We still don't know, and we'll maybe go out between drives and search for them. Anyway, it's also fireside chat tonight, so that's something to look forward to. And well done, Andrew, on camera. And thanks to Nikki, Tara, and Kirsty in the final control. We'll see you all next time. Over to James. Everybody, a quick greeting from us and Sindile here, sitting on a little termite mound. I think he's looking for dwarf mongoose. And Brian <laughs> said, don't go forward, he's going to come back behind us. And exactly as Brian predicted, that is what he's done. Thank you, everybody, for a wonderful drive. I will, while I'm in fact, I'm off. That's, that's going to be it from, from Sindile, I'm afraid, for this drive. He is standing behind us and giving me the very friendly eye that he does. Thank you very much for your contributions and your questions. Wonderful interactions we had again, especially about the baboons. Thank you for that. Thank you to Brian and the thumb. Mm -hmm. Thank you to Scott and Andrew on the other vehicle. I believe Andrew was a little nervous of the elephants, which I can't wait to talk to him about. And thank you especially to the final control, Mickey and Kirsty, for all their good work. And the thumb is just going to make a final appearance there. Uh, Sandile is now on a tree behind us. We're just going to quickly go. Can you get him? I'll try. Okay, I can't move the car. All right, so everybody, thank you for a wonderful afternoon. Uh, well, sorry, a wonderful morning. And we will see you later this afternoon. Keep safe and keep well wherever you happen to be on our beautiful blue planet. And we'll see you later. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.
Mm-hmm. 